All right, in this video, we are gonna do a very conceptual overview of the concept of frequency response. Now, if you have just taken a system dynamics class and you remember Bode plots really well, then you can probably skip this video, but if you haven't or you're a little rusty on it, then this is probably gonna be a good review with no math, just kind of the concept. So before we get into the more abstract representation, I think it's helpful to talk about kind of the classic example here. Just imagine pushing a kid on a swing, right? Or if I'm gonna draw a pendulum, I have a fixed pivot point with a mass, and you can imagine there's also maybe a little bit of friction here, and gravity's pulling the pendulum down, so it wants to be kind of here when it's in the neutral position. And if you're pushing this kid, and you want them to swing as high as possible or get the biggest amplitude as possible, then you want to push at the resonant or natural frequency of the, of the swing. So if you just pull the swing back and let it go, it's gonna oscillate at some natural frequency. You want it to go as high as possible. You should also push at that frequency. Now I could do an experiment and try pushing the swing at different frequencies and I could make a graph of the amplitude of the swing. So in this case, say that would be an angle, theta, and on the x-axis would be frequency in Hertz for how fast I'm pushing. And what I would see was that if I push really slow, the swing's gonna move, but as I kind of start pushing faster and approaching the resonant frequency, the swing's gonna move more until I get to a resonant peak. But eventually I kind of start pushing too fast and it just drops off and I'm, I'm just kind of tapping on it really quickly. The swing doesn't actually move at all. So this graph is what I mean by frequency response, but this concept applies to any system. The output or thing you measure doesn't necessarily have to be an angle. So we are gonna represent this more abstractly with a block diagram. So just this block is a system, it could be a pendulum, it could be a thermal system, an electrical system, where if this system is linear, this isn't a really differential equations review, but if I have a linear differential equation that can describe this system, again, if you've taken a system dynamics class, you probably remember one that looks like this, where all of your <coughs> variable and derivatives are just multiplied by constants, so I don't have like a x dot, x double dot term in there, it's a linear equation. If this system is linear and my input is a sine wave, so say the force I'm applying is sinusoidal, if it's a mechanical system or the voltage I'm applying is sinusoidal, if it's an electrical system, then the output is also going to be a sine wave. And that is the specific case in where this graph applies. So, and again, in a mechanical system, my output might be something like a position or an angle. In an electrical system, it might be something like a voltage or a current <clears throat> and I could also kind of graph these sine waves one at a time in the time domain where my x-axis is time instead of frequency. So let's use the electrical example. Say my output is voltage <clears throat> as opposed to force and position. I might have an input voltage that looks something like this. And then I can have an output voltage for my system, but it is going to be shifted in both phase and amplitude from my input. So the amplitudes aren't necessarily gonna be the same and the phase or time delay between them, wherever you wanna measure on these two waves, whether it's between the starts or the, the zeros or the peaks or wherever, there can be a time lag here. So the second part of this graph that I didn't draw, this is the amplitude part. We also have one for the phase where we usually say if they're, we measure phase in degrees, if they're in sync with each other at zero degrees, and then as the output kind of starts to lag behind the input, we represent that as a negative phase. So we might go down to, sorry, I didn't really extend my axis far enough there, but negative 90 or negative 180 degrees, or it might look something like that, depending on the system, where when I say 180 degrees means they are perfectly out of phase. So the output is the opposite of the input. So that is the negative 180 degree phase difference. And the blue one I drew there is maybe approximately halfway between those about 90 degrees. Now, depending on how much friction or in an electrical system resistance there is, you might not have this resonant peak. A system could be what we call over damped, where you kind of don't get the peak and it just drops off like that, or it can be critically damped, which is kind of right at the transition point where you start to get the resonant peak. Again, that's something you'd learn more about in the system dynamics class. Um, or in the case of a first order system, so where you don't have that second derivative term, then you actually can't have resonance. You need two independent energy storage elements that can kind of trade back and forth to get that um, resonant behavior. So in the case of 
<clears throat> the mass on a pendulum, that's the potential energy of the mass, the gravitational potential energy, and the kinetic energy of the mass trading back and forth. Um, or in an electrical system, that would be an RLC circuit where you have both a inductor and a capacitor that can store energy and sort of trade energy back and forth, whereas the resistor dissipates energy. Or again, in the classic system dynamics example, it's the spring mass damper. So don't get your springs mixed up with your resistors. Depending on the domain, it's a different um, different thing represented by the same symbol. But you have a mass on a roller and you're applying a force to the mass. So here, energy is being traded back and forth between the elastic potential energy of the spring and the kinetic energy of the mass. But if you just have, as we're going to see in the next couple videos, a first order system where there's just one energy storage element, like just a capacitor, then you're not going to have resonance and your frequency response amplitude graph is just going to look something like this. So that is what we are going to go over in the next video, specifically doing the derivation of how do you get this graph, including what the phase looks like for an RC circuit, which we have seen the step response of before. So what happens when we kind of send a step change in voltage into this circuit. Now we're gonna look at what happens when we send a sine wave voltage into this circuit. We're gonna look at the output, which as we just discussed, we know since this is a linear circuit is also gonna be a sine wave and we can get the frequency response graph like this. We'll also look at what happens when we invert or kind of switch the resistor and the capacitor and hint hint, if this is a low pass filter, this is gonna turn out to be a high pass filter and we will talk more about what that means and why it's useful when it comes to filtering different frequencies out of electrical signals.